We've talked about bonding. We've talked about the importance of carbon and its ability to form covalent bonds. We've talked about polymers as one important class of molecules. And then in our last lesson, we talked about the phases of matter and about phase transitions going from solids to liquids to gases as an example of something that is like a chemical reaction but is actually what we call a phase transition. Well in this lesson we're going to talk about chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are generally represented by having the reactants on the left, the reactants on the left with an arrow with the products on the right, such as my example here with two hydrogen gas molecules reacting with one oxygen gas molecule to form two water molecules as the product. So react, reactants on the left, products on the right. Now the, the reason I have the exploding Hindenburg is because this reaction is sometimes called the Hindenburg reaction because it's exactly what happened when the, the dirigible called the Hindenburg exploded. The Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen gas and when it, after it crossed the Atlantic Ocean something ignited the hydrogen gas and unfortunately it exploded. It was uh, an, an extreme tragedy. So the Hindenburg reaction is an example of a very explosive reaction. There are a variety of types of reactions that chemists study and I'll just give you a, a few categories. It's not so important for you to be able to recognize the reaction and tell that the hydrogen plus oxygen going to water is an oxidation reaction, for example. But the types of reactions can include acid-base reactions and you've probably heard of acids and bases like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Precipitation reactions, when you mix two things together and then a precipitate forms. Oxidation reactions such as the above. Reduction reactions which are reactions going the opposite direction. Uh, and polymerization reactions as we've talked about in the lesson on polymers. These are some examples of chemical reactions. So in general reactants on the left, arrow going to products on the right. Now reactions can be either what we call exothermic or endothermic. Exothermic means that heat is given off during the reaction, whereas endothermic means that heat is absorbed during the reaction. So, for example, if you happen to have a, a reaction taking place in a, in a container like a glass, if it were exothermic, you would feel the heat coming through the glass. If the, if the reaction were endothermic, it would feel cold. It would feel like heat is being absorbed from your body into the container. Now obviously the Hindenburg reaction is an exothermic reaction. You can see, you can almost feel the heat given off. Second concept, chemical reactions can be either fast or slow. Just because we put an arrow doesn't necessarily mean that it happens quickly. It may be a very slow reaction. It may take days, months, years, or it could be a very rapid reaction. The speed of reactions is described by what we call the kinetics of the reactions. But nevertheless, a reaction can be either slow or fast. What is the driving force of the reactions? Why does the arrow go from left to right? Why do reactants go to products? Because actually there are many things you can mix together and no reaction will occur. What makes a reaction occur? Well, essentially that question is, what is the driving force for a chemical reaction? There are really basically two fundamental types of driving forces. One is a tendency to form a more stable product or set of product mo molecules. That is, you're going from less stable to more stable. The second driving force is a tendency to increase entropy. Now entropy we covered in a, in a different chapter. Entropy is a measure of the disorder of the system. So if a reaction can occur to increase disorder, then that reaction has a tendency to occur. My top sentence, which is cut off a little bit, says chemical reactions occur spontaneously when products are more energetically stable than the reactants 
and or when there is an increase in entropy, what I just said in the previous slide. In this slide, I show a reaction of something called methane, CH4. That's the molecule in black with the four little white knobs, four hydrogen atoms, CH4, reacting with two oxygen molecules to form carbon dioxide and two water molecules. So I've represented this reaction with space filling models as well as showing the reaction in the, in the way that we ordinarily would write it. This is a prototypical chemical reaction. It also is an oxidation reaction. The way we describe the reaction in order to understand it better is shown in the bottom left using what is called an energy diagram. Energy versus time for the reaction. So this is actually representing the same thing we have in the upper part of the slide. On the left in this energy diagram you have the reactants, methane and the two oxygen molecules drawn at some arbitrary level and then we show that they overcome a barrier to form the products, the products being carbon dioxide and two water molecules. Now basically what we just said in the top sentence, if products are lower in energy than the reactants, then the reaction tends to go. It's like a, it's like a rock falling downhill or rolling downhill. Now, if the energy level is lower, that actually means that the molecules are more stable because of our convention that lower energy means more stable. So in this example, methane plus oxygen, when they react, they can overcome this barrier, go down the hill to a more stable bonding situation. If that happens, if they can go downhill, then the reaction will occur spontaneously. Obviously, if the products were higher in energy level than the reactants, then the, re the reaction would have to go uphill and it would not be a favorable reaction because it's, it would be like rolling a ball up a hill. It would not occur spontaneously. So things occur spontaneously when they go down a hill. In this part of the slide I expound upon this analogy. I show an example of someone pushing a boulder up a hill and if, as soon as it gets over the top of the hill, it can roll down the hill. And that is exactly analogous to our energy diagram for a chemical reaction. So the, the hill actually is referred to as an activation energy barrier. But as soon as it goes at the top of the hill, as soon as it can start rolling down, it goes to a lower energy situation. In the case of a boulder, lower energy with respect to gravity. When it's a chemical reaction, it's going downhill energy-wise to form a more stable set of bonds. Now, remember when we talked about water going downhill and turning a paddle wheel to produce electricity? Okay, Or we talked about how a weight, after it's lifted up, if it falls down, it can actually lift something else up. That is, we can do work, even produce electricity, by the boulder going downhill or the water running downhill and turning the paddle wheel. Similarly, the energy that is released in a chemical reaction, the delta E in this diagram, that energy can in some cases be used to produce work and if you remember from some earlier chapters, it can be used to produce either work or heat. And that is the important concept in thermodynamics that we are revisiting. When there's a change in energy in the system, it can produce either work or heat. So, in our example of methane reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, this can produce heat. In fact, methane is a component of natural gas and you may use this as a heating fuel. But also, there can be certain types of engines that could be powered by the reaction of methane with oxygen gas to perform work. So this slide summarizes some very fundamental concepts about chemical reactions, the thermodynamics of chemical reactions, the energy that is released, how that energy can be used to produce work or to produce heat. You may want to pause or you may want to look at this slide for some time to make sure you understand the concepts. Okay, now we'll take another break 
and have a little uh, quiz or exercise and come back later.